It's Thursday, July 26, 2012. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, the book club, we bring you Haruki Murakami's Q-1984. Let's do this. Or 1Q84. As you know, I, I alternate the pronunciation depending on what or I said last. Ichi-Q Hachiyon. Yep. Or... or <laughs> it is a trilogy. Well, it's three books, but well, anyway. But, yeah, in Japan, that's how they publish novels is they... Like here, when you buy a novel, you get the novel, right? In Japan, like a novel that you'll buy here that's like a lot of pages, in Japan will be like multiple small volumes. You can buy little tiny books all separately. They break things apart, whereas here, we like to collect things together to get like the omnibus edition. Ah, but at the same time, look at books like Prince of Nothing. It has big parts that are broken up. Right, but the thing is, in Japan, I think the reason they do that is that when you go to the bookstore, you get a whole bunch of books that are all the same size and shape. And they all just line up, so it's like they just, you know, break your book apart that way. Uh, you realize some of our younger listeners might be asking what you mean by a bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> it is true, but I mean, even having, even in the days of internet, right, having all the books be relatively the same size and shape uh, is really well, good for robots to pick the books out to send them to you. Well, remember a time before the industry fixed itself, when you went to buy a PC game, there was a, an arms race of the sizes and shapes of boxes. Yeah, it was like, who can make the biggest box to stand out on the shelf? And then they're like, all right, guys, look, all PC games will be in the same size box. And now PC games don't even have boxes anymore. Yep. Uh, but there was a time. Actually, I, re I got StarCraft. I did get StarCraft 2 in a box. And it was I. a standard StarCraft box but i mean i have old game boxes that literally you cannot put any of them on a shelf next to any other one of them without using up the entire shelf basically yeah uh <laughs> but now you just download the books and the games. actually you know what's crazy i was cleaning up stuff you know what i found the other day it's, it's in my bin of stuff to get rid of i found a vhs tape and an empty beta tape case Okay. Because we had a beta v a VCR at one point, too. Okay. Let me tell you, those beta cases were gigantic and had, like, this weird foam around them. Kind of like, remember the old Disney movie clamshells for VHS tapes? Yep. They had, like, that soft cover yep. and they were with the plastic, like, ridges coming out. Yep. Good times. <laughs> okay. I feel like, we anyway. All right, let's hurry this up. So, Google, it's been a long time coming. They promised they were going to bring awesome Google ISP to some city. They well, chose never mind that we speculated as nerds, year oh, what, like eight years ago when they started buying up Dark Fiber everywhere? Right, but anyway, they're going to do it in Kansas City. We knew this is old news, but the news is that they actually, you can now pre-register for it if you live in Kansas City, and they even posted the plans. So, check out these plans. You ready? These are unbelievable plans. If this was available in every city, all the other ISPs and cable providers would be fucked. Here we go. Ready? The middle plan, the least exciting plan, $70 a month, right, for internet only. However, it's gigabit ethernet. That's the least exciting plan is fucking gigabit ethernet. Now, now we know that that's net a neutrality, billion that's a billion bits a second. We know that net neutrality is already a problem in the rest of the world, but regardless of how that shakes down, if I'm on Google, 99% of my downloading bandwidth usage is actually not Pirate Bay anymore, it's YouTube. Right, but here's the thing. So, Rim, you have Fios, right, which is pretty yep. much the awesomest. How what's the speed on that? Uh, right now I got 25, 25. So 25. But I could, I, there's a new deal for almost the same money. I could get 50, 50. Okay. Think about upgrading. So 50, so let's say you get 50, 50. Yep. That's 50 megabits. So 50 million bits. How many 50 million bitses are there in a billion bitses? Well, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Oh my this God, is... Kansas, why can't you be New York? All right, so wait, that's plan. That's the boringest plan. Here's the, is the next plan that is more exciting. The free internet plan. It's not totally free. You have to pay $300 installation fee, construction fee, right? So... For z but it's $0 a month. You can also finance the $300 construction fee and pay $25 a month for 12 months, and then it's free from then on forward, or pay $300 lump sum, and it's free forever. And you get normal. It doesn't say exactly what the speed is, but you get normal internet speed. So basically what I get now for nothing. 
That's pretty crazy, especially for poor people can get awesome internet. Now, what's interesting is that I don't see this reflecting in Google's stock or like any. I don't think it's the, only in one city. Oh it's no, not, but, but the plans for this, like the the industry of cable provision and ISPs, and I I feel because like, it's only one city and it's not a super major city. Oh yeah, yeah. For now, it's not the smallest city for either. Now, but, but I note that the rest of the industry doesn't appear to be doing anything to prepare for this nuclear bomb that's about to drop well, on Well, it's only going to hurt them if this actually branches out to places. And if Google can actually... It's costing Google... It took them a long time and a lot of infrastructure and a lot of pain in the ass to get this to even work. So the difficulty of even getting this in New York will take many, many years. And they, in the, our market cares about the short term, so they're not worried yet. All right, now here's the crazy plan. Are you ready? All right. Gigabit, internet, and... Television, which is all, by the way, HD television with a fuck ton of channels, including the all important NFL network, right? $120 a month. But here's the craziness not only do you get the TV and the gigabit Ethernet, they also give What's you. What's behind door number three? You get to your contract, so you're locked into this thing, right? All right, all right? There's no data cap whatsoever. You can just go nuts. I don't think there's a data cap on any of this. Uh, you get a Nexus 7 tablet. You get a TV box, which is like the cable box for the TV. You get a storage box, which is basically they give you a free NAS, a Google-branded NAS, which is also sort of like a, an Apple Time Machine thing. The network box, which is the router, right? And they give you one terabyte of space for your Google Drive in the cloud, so you don't have to pay for that either. So the, it's even though it's $120 and you're paying for TV and Internet, you get all these crazy bonuses to uh, go with, you know, your other action. You actually, if you get the $70 plan, that also includes the no data caps and the Google Drive, but not any of that other stuff. So, Scott, I'm a, I'm a reasonable man. This seems ludicrous. Like, there's no way it could possibly be a, a true thing. Sounds like a scam. Is there any downside? It's a pre-registration right now, so when they're actually going to set it up, who knows? It's, you know, you're basically in like, the Like, do they get all my info? No, you're basically Do they in, get to watch me masturbate? You're basically in the like, beta test for this, so who knows how well it will actually work. But, yeah, I would sign up for this so fast. Oh, my God, yes. I've already <laughs> I basically consider, sold like, my soul to Google. Let's leave New York and move to Kansas City and start a nerd town there. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's probably really cheap to live there. All right. So, I might... Well, no, I will, because I just book plane tickets be in Sao Paulo next week. So Geek Nights, between all the stuff that's going on, might come or go. But, you know, I'm going to Sao Paulo for work, and I work in the stock market and everything, and I was paying attention to the stock market, but I don't work for a broker-dealer, so I can talk about stock stuff the that SEC happens doesn't give a shit about you? Without about getting in trouble. The SEC doesn't care about the SEC me. SEC says you can say whatever you want, we don't care? It, uh, other, you know, I have to follow the regulations of, you know, anyone talking about stocks. Obviously. So, uh, way back, I posited that perhaps Facebook was a crass cash grab, that the IPO was ridiculous, that Facebook was peaking, and that it was a poor investment. Well, Facebook stock has basically done nothing but go down since it uh, IPO'd. Mm. And today, earnings came out, and Facebook dropped another like 8.5%, and it's down even further in aftermarket trading. All right. And as far as I can tell, that was on the news that they beat some expectations. <laughs> Okay. So, what did the market do today? Uh, the market was up, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the market was fine. <laughs> see, usually, see, when a stock does the same thing the market did, then that means Yeah, nothing. if the market was down 8.5%, Scott, it, that would be huge news. Yeah. The stock market dropping 3% is a pretty big deal. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Facebook, uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I think Facebook has peaked or is peaking in the current, like, three-year window. Like... It's pretty much going to be all downhill from here. Facebook is going to go none the way of, of these, MySpace. None of it's these It's just going to take longer than it took yeah, MySpace you, to collapse. None of these things have any staying power. All internet things come and go, right? You know, one minute, you know, in our lifetimes, we've seen things. That we've seen many, many things that Live have looked journal, like. Live journal. Right. America Online. Right. It's America, like, remember, AOL Time Warner. Yeah, it's like you you go back in time and it's like, wow, Windows rules the world today. No one says that, even though they still sort of do. AOL, wow, they're the kings. No one can stop them. They run everything. They're gone now, effectively, you know, mostly, right? Yahoo, wow, that's the search engine, guys. No one get up. Oh, Google, right? 
connect at all, just in the, and it's only been like 20 years-ish of internetting. So my question right? is, how come no one who is not a technologist ever sees this coming? Yeah, every, nothing is permanent. Whatever feels like it's the unbeatable monopoly that runs everything is going to go away in less than 10 years. That has been the way of the internets and the technology well, sector Well, if we back up, if, if we widen a little bit, there was one exception. Nintendo pretty much was number one for a long goddamn time. Yeah, everything comes and goes. Sometimes you make a comeback even. Apple made a comeback. Yeah. You know? Nintendo sort of went away, came back, went away, came back, right? It happens. But nothing is locked. In the technology sector, you cannot get a lock even when you are a seeming monopoly. All right, so... Uh, things a day. Why, yes, things of the day. So, uh, if I had to rate jokers that I like, but if I had to rate them solely on their laugh, Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill is the undisputed champion. I mean, Jack uh, Nicholson was not too bad. Jack Nicholson had a better crazy face. Yeah, in I mean, person. His, but he means his laugh wasn't bad. He didn't do but a bad job. But he was job. more like uh, he was more like the old Batman Joker See, styling. Why didn't they include the 1960s Batman laugh? What's his uh, name? Cesar Romero. Yeah, I knew it was like Romeo something. <laughs> 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 How come he wasn't included in this video? I don't know. There are three. Basically, we got Jack Nicholson, Heath Ledger, and Mark Hamill, and, and it is basically a compilation of different laughs that they have done and it's if you watch this it's just gonna remind you that the joker is pretty much one of the best villains ever and eh, kind of it, it, all right superhero comics eh. name better villains that are actually better that you want to go watch stuff with them in it kind of like magneto he's pretty cool magneto's pretty good he's up there uh apocalypse all right scott all right scott really. dc villains a DC villain that's, a DC that's villain cool. That's, that's even remotely cool. DC villain, they don't really have cool villains uh, in DC so much. And yet they've got the Joker, who is almost as good as Magneto. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is just cool because it reminded me of how absolutely goddamn crazy Mark Hamill sounds when he plays the yeah. Joker. <laughs> All right, so check this out. This is a... Short history of death on the New York City subway. So it's basically a whole bunch of stories about ways people died because of the subway and such. It's pretty fascinating. But it's also cool because the uh, this design of this web page, this little track that runs all the way down the page, and as you scroll, this little train car drives down the web page, and it's really cute. Ah. La, 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 la. But it's also you're reading stories about people dying. Does it talk about the '70s when hobos were pushing people out of the tracks? Yeah, this this starts talking about things as old as 1900 when they were drilling the IRT and people were getting killed during the drilling. Wow. Right. So. Well, that's the thing. New York structures are are powerful both economically and physically in direct proportion to the amount of blood of workers that is integrated into the foundation. Yeah, here, I'll read that section for you. When drilling began for the original uh, Interborough Rapid Transit System in 1900, the IRT company recruited miners as skilled laborers useful for their underground experience. The miners made $3.50 a day, which in 1900 was a lot, actually, and put up with a working environment that held all the terrors of an actual mine. Rock slides patches of loose gravel, and sudden encounters with underground ponds, like dwarfs. Uh, there was a reported 16 deaths to drill the IRT in 1900. Wow. So when you're riding on a train that's got a number on it, that's an IRT train, if it's underground, just remember that that tunnel you're in, 16 people died so that tunnel could exist. And that's only the beginning of this article. <laughs> that sounds fascinating. About 26 people killed themselves using the train a year. That's less than I expected. But it claims around 200 victims total. Ah, so back to my Joker thing. The top comment says this. Mark Hamill sounds like a cartoon villain. Jack Nicholson sounds like a movie villain. Heath Ledger sounds like an actually scary psychopath. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because he's not doing something that's like unrealistic, you know. And, and I think my favorite of this video, my favorite bit is him in the, in the actual movie where his, he's basically fake laughing. He's like, ha, ha, ho, he, who, ha, ho. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you even seen that movie? Yeah. Uh, ha, ha, ho, 
So in the meta moment, Oticon is this weekend, and we are not there after almost a decade of going to Oticon. So follow it on Twitter or be there and follow it in person. Yes, our, our friend Dave Riley, who you may know from Fast Karate for the Gentleman, is going to be there doing the same video game journalism academic panel. Uh, Oticon, why are you doing video game stuff? Hey, we did our biggest panel at Oticon ever in the eight years we did D &D. panels at Oticon was Beyond Dungeons and Dragons. I know, right? <laughs> But he is there doing the same panel that he ran at Kineticon, and I'm going to try to get him to come to MAGFest and do it there, too. He's got to go to MAGFest. Oh, Mag my God. Oh God. Dave, Joel, uh, I told you Kineticon was fun, right? You realize there's an audience. You will enjoy MAGFest. You in fact, all of you Mag will enjoy MAGFest. MAGFest is the number one for that. But I got to admit, around noon, you know, because Daryl Surratt's at Oticon, n none of our front row crew is there, though. Like, no one from the old... You know, our crew that would go to Oticon is we're, going We're this done year. waiting in line. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, the rest of the crew bailed on Oticon for way before we did, and I think PAX actually caused them all to bail on it. Maybe. Because <laughs> remember, it was that first year all our friends went to PAX East, and then none of them went to any anime con after that. Mm. But anyway, around noon, I, re I remembered that all, for almost a decade of my life, Noon on Thursday was when we'd arrive in Baltimore for our weekend of craziness. And I got a little nostalgic. I have good memories of the Otterbean lobby. Right. And I have good memories of not waiting in line because we actually scammed our way out of waiting in that line almost every year we went. A few times. And I don't think I paid for more than one Oticon. <laughs> <laughs> the last time we skipped the line was because we got tickets to that concert outside of Oticon. Mm -hmm. And they let everyone who had tickets to that skip the line. I think a lot of people bought tickets just to skip the line. Maybe. Maybe. But anyway, Oticon's this weekend. If you want to get reports, Daryl Surratt is there, and he's already put out the Twitter call. He wants everyone who is there or who's on the internet and cares to find the creepiest missed connections from Oticon on Craigslist and forward them to him. Okay. <gasps> That is where the truth will be found. Go to the Baltimore Craigslist. Yes. Also, we will be at PAX Dev doing uh, academia versus reality, games, game design, game mechanics, psychology, all that stuff. And we will be at PAX Prime doing uh, three short mini panels. It'll be called Short Subjects in Gaming. It'll be on Friday. And after we... After PAX, I'm probably going to Django Con in D.C., which means even less geek time. And after PAX, I may be in Warsaw for a week or two, so... Things are getting crazy up in yeah. here. Remember, Geek Nights always had pseudo hiatus eye around this time between us going outside and us going to places. Eh, once winter comes, basically, after MAGFest, it'll be back to normal. Uh, I don't know. Look at historically, it's pretty much spot. It's in spotty the past few years. <laughs> the New York City era. You'll get an episode once in a while. Yeah, they're coming. They're coming. But uh, yeah, like I said, I'm flying to Sao Paulo like Tuesday next week. So we'll see how many shows we do. Oh, and the next book club, obviously oh, yes. not this one, is the man who was Thursday. I started reading it, but it's my every, choice. But it's it's not because the book is boring. But I start reading it whenever I get in bed. And I just sort of fall asleep immediately because I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I haven't read more than like three pages just because I fell asleep. But the man who was Thursday, now now that we're uh, you know we're doing 1Q84, I'm going to talk a little more about it. The man who was Thursday is a pretty old book. It's from 100 years ago. Mm. Actually, more than that, 1908. And it's a thriller set in Edwardian London back when anarchists were a big deal. Mm. And the basic plot is that there's a cop who has to infiltrate the anarchists. And it turns out that he's a better anarchist rabble rouser pretending to be one than any of the actual anarchists. And then he starts to discover that maybe other people are running other anarchist groups are cops like him. And then it just gets crazy from there. Mm. It the was cover is pretty awesome. I got the Penguin Book Edition just because the cover was so awesome. I got the 295 Kindle Edition because I don't like having physical media. I don't like to pay for a DRM ebook. I would have pirated it if I was going to get the ebook version. But this book is mentioned in Deus Ex, so there's a little bit of a nerdy tie. Also, when I mentioned that I was choosing between this and The Great Gatsby, a number of not Geek Nights listener kids, but adults mostly fathers were like yes i had to read that in school you should totally do it mm -hmm. and also one kid was like no if you do it my dad's been trying to get me to read this forever <laughs> so uh yeah i'm doing it mm -hmm. All i right. started reading it too and i'm liking it so far so let's talk about qt84 all right 1q84 so uh again it was, it was my pick it was this so is the geek nights book club spoilers 
be warned beyond this line because we're talking about it as though you've already read it. We're yeah. not going to explain the plot. So uh, I chose this book for a few reasons. Reason number one, Haruki Murakami is uber famous and pretty much every a whole bunch of nerdy people, especially like anime creators and manga artists, all cited Murakami as like a major influence. Two... Uh, he is like the number one best-selling, oh my god, Japanese novelist uh, of late. And three, I saw everyone on the subway reading this freaking book, so I'm like, whoa, this keeps showing up everywhere. This must be important. Let's read it. So we did. Yep, and I point out that I read 1Q84 literally knowing nothing about it. I didn't even read the book jacket. I, I just, knew I opened it nothing. To page, I opened it to page one I and I didn't even reading. know it was 900 pages plus until someone told me. I just knew what the cover looked like. When I started reading it, I still didn't know it was 900 pages because I was reading the Kindle edition. And <laughs> I, didn't really... I looked at the bottom at the percentage area <laughs> yes. and I, someone had told me already and I, I clicked next page and the percentage didn't move and I was like, ah. I did not notice until I got several chapters in. I was like, wait a minute. What do you mean 1%? <laughs> so... I didn't know it was about uh, murder with needles or crazy sex. <laughs> or two moons. Or little people. Yeah. And the thing is, it didn't matter. I was drawn in. I was drawn in the second that cab driver in the opening well, that, scene said his line. See, that's the thing. That first chapter makes, is the only reason I can, like, if that, for, if, the, if the second chapter was the first chapter, the book would not have happened. Nope. Right? That first chapter, and you could see how all the anime creators were citing that. It's like, oh my god. I mean, even though this came, you know, this is pretty recent, right? Because you don't know what's it's, going on. It it's, that t it's so typical of a thing I see in animes and mangas all the time. Somebody, a girl, <laughs> you know, is in a weird situation. She's transferred to another world. That uh, might as well have been the start of Escaplone yeah, right there. Bit. She's in a normal situation, and then things take a turn yep and it, you can already see that even though you know it, it's all those animes like the be very beginning of the show there's something normal but there's also something weird then the sh you go to another world where the plot happens and at the end there's the terrible secret of space that brings you back around to that stuff at but the i beginning. noticed that the weird thing happened but you don't know it happened until much later well i mean it was so blatant right there at the beginning. No, because it like, could have... I didn't know it was magical realism or fantasy. I didn't so, either, but as soon as that cab driver says, what did he say? Oh, he basically said, be careful. Once you do something like that, once you see the world from a perspective of doing something like that, things can change. Yeah. Things aren't ever the same I forget again. his exact language, and I have the Kindle edition, so it's hard to I know. bring it that up. Is, I got to get those exact words, because that is... What, what Wait, let me let me there, let me teleport to the beginning of the book. Okay, here. you try to find it because what he said there is probably my favorite moment in the book, and I think it's on my list of favorite lines in books ever. It's pretty great because I, when I read him saying that, one the whole time the description of the cab up to that point, the Janicek uh, symphony, like just all dude. I went and I listened to that Janicek symphony because yeah. it's on uh, Spotify. Uh, yeah, oh, it's really good. I knew Janicek because of my music theory classes at uh, both RIT and high school, but I didn't know that particular sinfonietta. Mm -hmm. But the description of that cab and everything, it might sound odd, but it basically reminded me very strongly of the cab driver and the surreal cab scene in Beautiful Dreamer. Here we go. The Urusei Yatsura movie. Remember go. when they're in the cab and the cab driver's weird? It does have a lot of the Urusei Yatsura weirdness. Yeah, right, but so, no, yeah. not Urusei Yatsura weirdness. Beautiful Dreamer. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm talking weirdness. about. So, uh, here that's it goes. That's like saying Lupin weirdness, but you're talking about Cagliostro. Well, completely... I found, I found the, uh, the thing here. Okay, read it, because this is... Uh, this I is... suppose you're right. Okay, right. And after you do something like that, the everyday look of things might seem to change a little. Things may look different to you than they did before. I've had that experience myself. But don't let appearances fool you. There's always only one reality. When the guy says there's always only one reality, I'm like, oh, snap. You basically just told me she's going into another world, but it's not, but it is, but it's not. And that's exactly what happens. And I, I, and I got through, I was like, this is great. And then I follow her, and I'm not really sure what's going on. And then she murders that guy out of nowhere. Yeah. That was. It's that like, was, well, you know, because they, it's that typical thing where it's sort of the, uh, I, you know, it's funny to bring this up, the concealed Chekhov's gun. Yeah. Right? Where it's, they keep something hidden from you. What is her job? Where does she have but to get to in such a hurry? But yet it's portrayed in such a mundane way that you think it's like a business meeting. Right. Like you don't even care about it. But I mean, it. it's that same trick. It's like you, 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 
let the, you make it really obvious that you're hiding something. It's like you put a curtain right there in the middle of the room and there's something behind it. And you're like, you know, there is a curtain here with something hidden behind it. And behind it is whatever she's her job is. But the thing is, I looked at the curtain. I'm like, yeah, it's some bullshit business meeting. I wanted to know why that cab driver said what he said. Why? Yeah, what did that cab? You when, still don't know she what saw the, the cab cop, driver no. When she saw the cop and she was like, wait a minute. Cops don't. That I was, was like, after she went through, right? Yeah. yeah, but even then, it was before the murder. Mm. So I see that, and I'm like, I'm focused on that and the cab driver. And I'm and as I'm reading, I'm thinking back to that and the cab driver, that and the cab driver. And then the needle comes out, and I had my first uh, Murakami moment, meaning you read a sentence, and you stop and go, wait, what? And you back up and read the sentence again. You're like, oh, really? That's, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> so anyway. That happens like a hundred times in this book. A zillion times. Like you read like way toward the end, even when I was expecting stuff like that, I was still like toward the end when they're when they're explaining why she has to kill the leader <laughs> of the cult. I guess that's in the middle. And I'm reading, I'm like, ah, da, 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 destroyed uterus. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so you know, you, you get the story of Amame and you know, she enters this crazy other world and she's an assassin, right? And then it flips over to Tango's story. As soon as I hit Tango, I'm like, Oh, I don't care about this. Well, and then I cared a lot. So here's the thing with Tango, right? So it does the t that trick where it's e every other chapter is about the two characters. It goes back and forth between the two. So I'm reading the Tango chapters, and it's like, oh, so he's a writer. So it's that always book within a book. The yeah, Bilbo well, you know what? Straight up, we're going to analyze this book. 1Q84 is straight up allegory of the relationship between the creator and the created, and that no one can create a work like a creative work a drawing a novel anything in a vacuum everything they do is influenced by the things around them and all those things together are the creator not any one person yeah i mean that's the whole thing where they're talking about how like you know because tango has to rewrite the book yep you know and then the uh the 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 indirect con uh, conception what was the phrase for the indirect sex ambiguous congress that's right like, he has sex with the one girl, but really he's having sex with the other girl. Yeah. And how that is the act of the creation of the new universe. And how two people having sex and making a baby is the same as two people collaborating on a work. The work is both of them, but yet it's distinct. All That's the allegory, but yeah. Yeah, it's like Fuka Eri wrote it, but Tango rewrote it. So who's the real author? The both are, but they, even more than them. You know, the little people are also sort of the author if they exist. But, you know, uh, anyway. So you get this Tango story, and I was convinced to, like, halfway through the book that the Aomame chapters were actually Air Chrysalis. Nah. And there was, you know, the, the doubt that that was the case increased, but there was, it was always a reasonable doubt that those Aomame chapters were actually the rewritten Air Chrysalis. And I was convinced that they were so because... The supernatural weird things like little people and traveling to another world and taxi drivers and such only occurred in the Aomame chapters up until very deep into the book. And then at some point, the weird, like, you know, I think it was before the cat town, but still pretty close to it. The I found supernatural myself using the term cat town to yeah. refer to things like that. It was very late in the book, like almost halfway through, that supernatural things were occurring in the tank. Tango chapters, and also there there were connections between the Almame chapters and the Tango chapters that confirmed they were in the same world, like encountering the same people or knowing about each other and such and such, right? Uh, but it was also it, it was around the time that you know Tango talked about you know the the you know knowing. Oh, Mame from when he was, you know, in school and she was yep. like the scary religious so girl. So I want to back up a little bit because Emily showed me this when we first started reading the book. Okay. And it's Haruki Murakami Bingo. And then after looking at this, I realize that many of the things, like there's, well, here, I'll go through them first. Here is Haruki Murakami Bingo. Mysterious woman. Check. Check. Ear fetish. Check. So that's the point because in this book, you know, there were some cute moments with ears. Related to sex, and I, I basically he talked a lot about Fuka Eri's ears. Yep, but I and how they were covered with hair, or then you could see them. They'd poke out like little Alvin things. You just right. wanted to lick them. Exactly. But I thought that was a nice touch. Like it was an interesting, like fleshing out of this, you know, scene. But now looking at this bingo and seeing ear fetish as number two on the list, I yeah. The thing is, all, pretty much all of these things are in QT84. 
I wonder. I haven't read any of other Murakami's books, but based on this bingo this card, this guy read twelve have, of them and three short stories and one memoir. I and have said, to assume. Yeah, this bingo. I have is to legit. assume that these th- items on this bingo are in his other books. So I'm gonna, you know, I think I'm gonna read that Kafka on the shore next because the most famous. Emily read that one. She said it was weird. I'll read it. Some- <laughs> I'll read it eventually, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna have a lot of these bingo card All items. All right, so let's see. Dried up well, we didn't have. Uh, was there a dried up well maybe in the crazy town that was locked up where the little people were from that Fukari oh, escaped from? I don't from? remember. I, I don't, don't think know. so. Anyway. Something vanishing. Yeah. Feeling of being followed. Yeah, all the time. Unexpected phone call. Yes. Cats. Well, I mean, they did the whole thing yeah. with the phone and how he could I tell. I tell. He could tell who was calling based on the ring. What was the guy's name? The the editor? It's been so long since I read it already. Really? It was uh, Komatsu. Komatsu. He could tell when Komatsu was calling because it sounded like his ring. Yep. Or it was like he'd be like it ring, but there's no way that's right. Komatsu. Cats? Yeah. Old jazz record. Yeah, they would the the his uh his lover is who his, was yeah, clearly the, murdered by her husband. Exactly. The spouse. I like how you never found out, but you can assume. Well, I mean, it was sort of it, that matched up with the story of Aomame's childhood friend who was killed by her husband. Yes, and also Aomame's newer friend who was murdered randomly by strangulation, and then the girl he met in the cat town had a similar situation in her past. Yeah, but she wasn't dead though. It didn't matter because. Yeah. The, oh, that, no, she had the vision that she knew that's how she was going to die, remember? Mm-hmm. The thing is, all those things are like, the writer has an experience like that and then uses that element, like the core of that idea, in a story they write. You can see the allegory coming back in it, but I digress. I also want to point out something just sort of meta, right? I'm usually pretty bad at remembering stuff, and I forgot Komatsu's name, yeah. but look how much I remember from this book, even though I read it. You know, like a month or two ago. Usually, I would not remember this much. I think that is a consequence of a few things. Number one, it's really good, uh, and number two, the length of it. Things are repeated so much, right? You you keep seeing the same things over and over again, so you're not going to forget them. Even though I forgot to take notes, and I probably should. All right, have. Scott. What was the first town that Kellis gets to after he gets out of the uh, scary place? In the beginning, first book. Oh fuck! I know where it is on the map. I know. And he bar- they barely even mention that he's there, but the- he he like meets all these people there, and, and he then creates they all the die. Al- he creates him. the Aldonyani, yep. and then they all die in order f- for him to get to the woodsman guy. Yep. Who is much closer to where near? Anyway. Atrathau. Atrathau. That's it. Yeah. Anyway, urban ennui. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean <laughs> urban no, the ennui. Picture, the picture is someone looking out at. The windows that are lighted in the evening from a balcony. And looking at a playground? <laughs> yeah, the, the, well, I mean, that's the last urban ennui, but there's plenty of other urban ennui. Whole, yeah. Tango sitting in his apartment bored when, the you know, rubber going plant, to work. That poor rubber plant. I want to get a rubber plant. Really? Uh, there's also, uh, what's his name on the stakeout? Oh, Ishikawa. Ishika- Uchi- Uchikawa. Uchikawa on I the really stakeout like has got urban ennui. Pretty much everyone is sitting around in, in apartments bored, thinking and talking a whole lot. And looking at the other people around them going, oh, I wonder how sad their lives are. All right, supernatural powers. Check. Running. Check. Secret passages. Uh, Yeah, staircase. uh, Free space. And it's a picture of a moon and another moon. Another moon. (laughs) (laughs) I want to talk about the two moons. Let's get there. Uh, You mean how those are allegories for Alamame's breasts? Yes. Yeah. Train station. Yep. They focus on the train stations a, a lot. lot. And he goes to that rest that bar. He uses the train, the train to station. go to the cat town. You know it was crazy reading this and book. And he, he can't miss the last train out of the cat town. I when I, I was in Tokyo for a while with Emily, like two weeks. Well, I, you know, in Japan and Tokyo. And I actually the descriptions made a lot more sense because I'd been there, because train stations in Tokyo and around Japan have a particular feel to them. And this book captures train that feel. to a ridiculous degree. I know that feel, bro. Historical flashbacks. Uh, we did get that. Remember the student protests and the whole like Professor Ebisu thing? Uh, I guess that sort of counts. Because you get the historical it's flashback. A fake, of, it's a fake history, but it is a, sort of a... No, but it's tied to a real history. It is. Uh, precocious teenager. I don't know. Is Fukari precocious? Uh, it depends on, you know... I liked her as a character a lot. Oh yeah, I mean she was she was pretty much you know that sort of Ayanami Ray situation. <laughs> like as soon as he, she showed up, I'm like, oh, that's the magical girl who's the powerful one, like yep. Nadia or you know Nausicaa or whoever you wanted to cooking. be. Cooking. Yeah, lots of cooking. Speaking to cats. Uh, did he speak? Anyone speak to a cat? The cat town. The cats talk to him. 
Oh, that's true. But that's yeah, not. But no one was actually talking to true. Cat cats. He, he talked to he, the owl. Talked to him instead. Yeah. Uh, parallel worlds. Yeah, that's what the book's about. Weird sex. Yep. Chip kid cover. Yep. <gasps> Tokyo at night. Mm -hmm. Unusual name, and it has a name tag. This is Al Mame. Okay. <gasps> Uh, and the only last two, faceless villain, we didn't really get. Well, I guess we didn't. We kind of saw the little people. Yeah, you could I don't stretch it and say that they villains. were faceless villains. And vanishing cats, which uh, we didn't get. I don't know if there's any vanishing cats. Someone might, you know. So precocious means unusually advanced or mature in development, uh -huh. especially mental development. Uh -huh. So yes, Fuka Eri is incredibly precocious because she's way smarter mentally than her age, even though she's not socially developed. So if we play and she's also physically developed well beyond her age, and they mention that often, like you know, whoa, she's got like a woman's body, even though she's like a teenager. So, we win this bingo like eleven times over. <laughs> mm, yeah. <sighs> I right, mean, so you, wa you wanted to talk about breasts, right? So you know they talk about you know the two moons, right? You only see the two moons if you're sort of in the other world, right? And that's how you know. But only certain people see the two moons, but they're always afraid to ask, and they never ask anyone about the two moons. Right? No one ever asks. It's like and everyone thinks, should I ask? No, that'd be crazy. Yeah. I can't Are ask these other that. people in this world, you know, like, you know, the Dowager, for example, does she see the two moons? Confirm and that would confirm that they are all in another well, world. Well, obviously it's all allegory that people don't pay attention to the greater existential world around them. And it's possible that everyone notices them but doesn't think about it. But we know that's not true because look at the meta plot. The book that they wrote inoculated people against the little people because it described these things. It's zebra storyteller. Oh, uh, you're bringing your zebra storyteller because into it's it? literal here. That book was a literal zebra storyteller that prevented the little people from doing their bullshit. Yeah, the little people were very upset that the book was being distributed talking about them. You know, so they, it very well could be what you what you say. Uh, but anyway, you had the two moons, and one was smaller than the other, you know, but they, it's like one, you know, and then you also had the, with the air chrysalis, you know, the Maza and the Dota. Yeah, Maza and Dota, really? Right, Come it's like, on. really, you could have done better than that. But I guess in, J in Japanese, if you don't know English, that maybe works, I don't know. It didn't work very well as an English reader. Well, I was like, um, Maza, and I was like, what? Okay, cool, so that's the thing. Then they're like, Dota, and I'm like, wait And I'm like, minute. Defense of the Ancients, what? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so you have the Maza and the Dota with the Air Chrysalis, and then you have Amame constantly... You know, going back to the fact that she, you know, she doesn't like her boobs, and they're one is different than the other. So you get the boobs, the moon, the muzzle, and the dota. It's that same repeating thing of there is a main thing and there is a second smaller offspring, right? The offspring, the creation of the thing that ties back to the writing of the book, right? It's it's that same thing repeated over and over again, the same imagery in different forms all over the place. Now. I want to take an aside. I, you know, it flipped back and forth between two characters pretty much the entire time until we got Ushikawa. Yep. And that was so weird because he's like this side character who well, was... Well, when you first introduce him, you hate him. Oh, you, he's like the worst guy. You're like, this is the sleaziest, evilest Yeah, you're dude. like, finally there's a bad guy with a name that we can see who's actually doing stuff and not sort of like this mysterious little people or, you know, the mysterious leader or any of those kind of groups, right? There is a bad guy with a name and he's right there in front of you and they per he's portrayed as like the, the most disgusting person you don't want to be near him you don't want to talk to him you don't want to look at him like i really felt like he was a slimy otaku fanboy even though he wasn't a nerd but you know that kind of personality i pictured Get the fuck someone away from we me. won't name from rit yeah exactly I, in fact i pictured him looking exactly like only that with, i figured him having like a little slightly longer greasier nasty hair though. yeah anyway but uh then we got him, his perspective, and he basically became a main character up until he was Yeah, killed. it's like book three. It's like chapter one, Uchikawa. I'm like, what, what, what? Yeah. Again, then, the Murakami backs a like, double take. Right. And he's portrayed in a way that is, you know, he's still a disgusting, bad person. But it's like suddenly they tell, he gives you all this information about him and shows you the side of him that you don't completely hate him. You can sort of empathize with this aspect of of him in a weird way and it's like oh you made me hate this guy and now you make me like part of this guy why you do this hey Scott remember Barado yeah <laughs> <laughs> right but I really like Ushikawa as a character yeah. as a person still don't no. like him that much but <laughs> again I like the fact that they really make a point about how he was ugly and 
this was basically the only thing he could do. Yeah. And how he did it well. But he was not a professional. And that whole plot about Tamaru was a professional in the Master Keaton sense. Oh, yes. And... I really like that. Tamaru is definitely the like the King Cosma of the book. That character that's just, oh, he's the awesomest dude. But at would... the same time, he's a professional. You feel bad for him in the sense that he is a Master Keaton professional. That is that is his life. He yeah. has nothing else. He's, de- he's definitely not the happiest character, but he's just the most badass character. Well, the fact that he pulls Astro Boy Batman, as in when Aomame calls him, he's like, yeah, I found the guy who's spying on us. He fucking murders the guy. like Straight away, night. just like, bam. Over. And he murders him in a pro- super professional way, but yet he feels like detached and a little bad about it. He's like, yeah, sorry I got to kill you, but uh, <laughs> that's how it goes. That's how it goes. It's also cool that like... You oh, know- when he calls Sakigake and he's like, uh, you should come and pick up your package. I left it here. Yeah. Doors unlocked. Well, and then, you know, he's he's shown in contrast to what tall guy and ponytail and Yep. Who were what's, what's the other guy? Ponytail and And Buzzcut. Buzzcut. Who were dangerous and smart and you know, masters. But not professionals. They were not professionals. I don't know if they were masters either. They were just Well they weren't no, they were masters, but they were not masters of life. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder... They were more like Bebop and Rocksteady. But I've seen a lot of Japanese works that have this idea of there are skilled people and then there are professionals and there are these stereotypes of the, quote, professional. Like, when that term... I like the out- sushi master, the sword master, yes. you know? The... Uh, what's the guy from Kill Bill? But, so, 1Q84 and Master Keaton both Hattori portray... Hanzo. That professional character as being also a little sad... Mm-hmm. And I, I gotta find out what the actual Japanese word that was used in both of those, and see if this is a trope of Japanese stuff. I almost want to see if I can turn that into a panel. Well, or I mean, something. that's the thing, right? It's like we've watched so much anime and ma- and read so much mangas, right? I haven't read that many Japanese novels, even translated ones. Maybe this is might even be the first one novel I've ri- read by a Japanese author. Maybe I've read a light novel or visual or something. I don't know. Uh, but it's like you you see, oh. It's, you know, this real, I've seen Japanese live action movies too. And you see these tropes and now I begin to see those, the things that I liked in anime, a lot of those weren't necessarily things from anime. They were, you know, Jap, they were things that are common to Japanese fiction, you know, uh, across the board. And that's why you get so much of the influence going in all the different directions. So I really, now my question is like, what is it about, Japanese society and Japanese culture that has put these tropes into Japanese fiction works across all mediums. Why are there so many stories about traveling to another world? Why are there so many stories about, you know, uh, some weird supernatural thing? You know, why is there always some magical, mysterious, quiet girl? Why is there, all, you know, how, why, what is it about the Japanese people and their society that makes them really like stories like this? And why do I always like stories like that, <laughs> even though I'm not from Japan? You know, these are questions I don't have answers to that would require some research. But yeah, Tamaru gets uh, mad points because he and, you know, the Chekhov's gun. I like how they when Aomame asks for the gun, he gets it to her and he's like, it's Chekhov's gun. If I give you this, it's going to be fired. Oh, I, I like, love how meta that is. I love how it was never actually fired and how there was a forward flash to events that don't actually take place. Yep. Like when there was that forward flash to her being held by Sakigake and like like being forced to give birth to the baby and all those things i basically expected that to happen and i was like like when she went out to trail ushikawa i was like fuck this is when she's going to get kidnapped and then when tamaru just fucking kills him and they get away i was like what yeah the fact that chekhov's gun and chekhov's uh like foreshadowing were both wrong and yet we're pointed at. I feel like every time this novel pointed me at something, it wasn't going to happen. Well, it's weird because in a way that Chekhov's gun, right, was and what was fired and was not fired at uh. the same time, right? Because, you know, the, the, a gun appears, right? And he says in the book, a character says, you know, Chekhov, right? He, Chekhov said when a gun is in a story, it has to be fired. But, oh, my, but in the end, she basically said not all stories have to follow conventions. Exactly. So in a way, the, the item, the physical item of the gun was not the Chekhov's gun. The, the Chekhov's gun was the meta of the characters saying Chekhov's gun. Yo, dog. So in a way... 
the gun not being fired was the Chekhov's gun, and having it end without being fired was it being fired. They fired the non-firing gun when the book ended, and it yep. wasn't used. I also liked how at the end they escaped. I like how she tried to escape by just walking, you know, doing the same thing she did before. And it well, failed. okay, so and then later she's like, "Da!" And right. Then she goes up. Well, when she down. went down the first time, right? Yeah. She tried to go down and it didn't work. I immediately, I was already thinking like ten pages before that when she started thinking about the staircase. I was like, "Yeah, go up." And then when she went down, I was like, "Why didn't you go up?" I expected. And then when later she went to go up, I was like, "Snap." I expected them to get into that same cab. I was I was looking for the cab too, so badly. I was really I was hoping like, for that. I was like, "Oh, let the cab be at the top of the staircase." That would have been, especially if the <laughs> if the cab driver when they got into the car was just like, "I figured you'd be back." Yeah, or something like well, that. Well, remember there was also these but, other cars on the road, like the old lady in the car, like the old rich lady in the limo, or whatever, yep. or driving the I guess Benz or something. And I was trying to make a connection between that old lady driving the car on the highway and the dowager from the other world. And I, I couldn't really, I was like, eh, eh. There, was, uh. there wasn't really much to go on there. But it's like, when they started talking about that old lady driving on the highway, I thought of the Dowager, but, but I couldn't really find any specific thing that says, the, you know, that puts them together. But I liked how when she, they escaped, and they're on the highway in the new world again, and then she looks at the Esso Tiger, and she's like, oh, he's reversed. We're in yet another different world. Yep. Because there are a lot of ideas in this book that you can't go back. Well, like, that, you can't set things back to course. the way they were ever. You're always moving forward. Everything you do changes reality around you. Mm -hmm. And it was that was just kind of ever-present. It wasn't the core of the book, but it was there. And I'm glad that that continued. Yep. Granted, all I thought of was that episode of uh, The Simpsons where Homer goes back in time and keeps fucking up the future. And eventually he finds a world that's close enough. Well, it says, things may look different to you, like the SO tire being backwards, right? Yep, but there's only then one reality. Then they did before. I've had that experience myself. So the cab driver has seen this happen, but don't let appearances fool you. There's only one reality. And when he says only one reality, I wonder, are, is he saying that there's only one reality and when you think you're changing realities you're really just seeing the world from a new perspective because of the things that have happened that's one to you. Way, that's one way to look at it. Here, or, I'll do the Japanese thing. That's or, something some people might think. Yes, or <laughs> the way I was seeing it is that there is one reality that contains these different universes and you're traveling between them. So even though it's like that other universe you were in still exists. Right in this same reality, you were there. Now you are here in a different in Q T eighty four. Right, but you can't go back. It's a one way street to go to the next. But that universe. means that the other reality might as well not exist. So there still is only one reality. Right, but it it does still exist somewhere. Just it doesn't not it doesn't matter if it exists though if you can't interact with it. Yeah, it's you know that's just you know. Philosophy. And you know what? You know where it exists in your memory and nothing more. The only way you even know. That there was another one. Because it's things because look you, different. Yes, you remember two something moons, different. There's a backwards thing, right? And how do you even know your memory, right? It's not like well, they no, took a picture of the two moons and brought it with that, them. Well, and two brilliant things. One, this was set in 1984, so there weren't smartphones and internet to just handle that. Was, all that. Yeah, that was a very clear. Let's talk about that because... You know, the level of technology that's going on in 1984 <laughs> is pretty much perfect, right? It's like you don't have the advanced technology, so there's not a lot of plot holes. Because basically, advanced technology, even modern technology, which is highly advanced, is like superpowers. We can travel around the world so fast. We can communicate with anyone, anywhere, Dude, I got a so direct, easily. Dude, I got a direct flight not that long ago from an airport that's really close to my house to... Istanbul. It was a nonstop right. nine-hour direct flight. In 1984, flight. they had planes, but it wasn't, you know, like it is today. Yeah. Right? Uh, there was there were less flights. You'd have to go home and call someone on the phone. The all the descriptions. Yeah. How do you of, get the plane ticket? You can just buy them on the internet. All the descriptions of Uchikawa having a film camera and getting his pictures developed yep. and having the rapid fire shutter and everything. Yep. But at the same time, it wasn't so 
old fashioned, like a Hitchcock movie, you know, where you're you're, you're like stranded. It's like the, the the characters could do things, and it was it was exactly right for this story to where you wouldn't have like these super power loopholes. Like, why didn't Superman just do this? But at the same time, you weren't so limited that it was boring. Like, oh, he just said it in like 1910, yep. you know, before there were cars, so they had to have a foot race and he get caught. You and know? I liked how Amame when she saw the moon, she's like, "Was it always that way? Am I just crazy?" Yep. Which is a very, and then she's like, no, if I even consider that I'm crazy, then I'm probably not. Yep. <laughs> but that moment where uh, Tango is looking up at the moon and Ushikawa's watching him and Ushikawa's just like, what the fuck is he doing? And then Ushikawa looks up and sees the two moons is like, oh, uh, like that moment where he starts Well, it shows that he was a person who had never looked up. Uh, almost everyone in the world had never looked up. Well, looking the- up is clearly a metaphor. Yes. But. But it's, you know, but it's it's just, you know, it's, it's an aspect of him that's like, you know, what happens when a person who is probably, you know, sure, no, hardly anyone has looked up, but the person who has really never looked up is Uchikawa. Right? Yeah. So when a person who has never looked up, the person farthest from the uplookers looks up, it's like, look what happened there, right? Just totally blown away. Yep. So let's get back to a little bit what the cab driver said, because we both experienced this. How many, and, you know, we just talked about it. How many years did we go to Otakon yep. and love it? And we were like panelists, but joining the staff, working the artist alley, going to PAX as a guest speaker instead of an attendee. Once you see conventions from those perspectives, if you go to a normal convention as an attendee again, everything, you see everything completely differently. Oh, yeah. I you mean- can never see it any other way again. I really think that was like the part of the book I enjoyed more than anything else is even though he's describing these supernatural experiences that would never happen to any real person, somehow they relate to things that really happened to to me, at least in my real life. Well, that cab driver... I see something in a different way and now I can't see it the old way ever again. That cab driver could have just... He went to an anime con and then he helped run it. Yeah, (laughs) I had some sort of surreal experience that might as well have been little people, but it wasn't actually little people it was just dream i like how they were actually imagination i really liked how they were actually literally just little people yeah that That was was kind of weird right great you know the air chrysalis where you know you work hard on creating something you know with with you know your hard work night after night and then when it forms you know not only have you created a new thing but now you're also seeing things differently and you're a new person you know and it's it's like ah you know, every one of those things, even though I did not literally make an air chrysalis or whatever, right? I'm sure all of you listening as well, you have done all the things that have happened in this book, you know, including not shoot someone. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, being paranoid about people watching you, you know, all this stuff. You know, I, if we haven't said, I really like this book. Oh, really? <laughs> you don't say. I really, <laughs> really enjoyed it. Yeah. Scott picking the books that people enjoy. That was a good book. Yeah. Uh, do we want to say anything else? Oh, I do want to say one thing, right? Uh, in this. Uh, okay, because I have one like big thing I want to say. It's the only uh, mine, thing mine's I just liked. Met, mine's meta, so you can go. Okay. So, the one thing that pissed me off is that the plot to kill the leader of Sakigake was bullshit. That was a stupid plot. Uh, it wasn't because, the dumbest no, plot. No, no, no. Here's why it was dumb. Okay. The whole point of her killing him as opposed to someone else or some other way was that she can kill people in a way to where no autopsy can possibly figure it out, Mm -hmm. that it appears to be a natural death. Had she not disappeared and emptied her apartment and made it obvious that she had killed him, there is no way they would have known, and she was a public enough figure because of her work to where they couldn't have just disappeared her. That's unlike sort Komatsu, of true. Unlike Komatsu, who was such a recluse, it was trivial to disappear him. That's sort of true, but at the same time, right? If you're the last person to see a dead person and you killed the leader of a crazy cult, they're probably going to come after you anyway. So your best bet is to run away and hide, even no, if because, they no, give no, you away. No, because she had blackmail on them in that she had knew the leader was dead if they go to her. Mm, that crazy storm is here. That's meta. I know. We're watching a crazy thunderstorm roll over New York City. Okay. We've been waiting for this all day. <laughs> uh, okay, so the meta I want to talk about is in the back of this uh, edition I have on my Kindle that I illegally acquired. Uh, there's questions for discussion. I, got, I had that too. 
and summon. These are the lamest book club questions. Oh my god! I looked at that. I was like, "What is this third grade?" I was like, like when I saw class? that, I was like, "Okay." These, I saw it. it said questions for discussion, and I was like, "Oh, there's a chance that these, a very small chance, these could be good, and maybe we'll use them on the book club episode." They were pretty much universally bad book club questions. Like the first one. 1Q84 is a vast and intricate novel. What are the pleasures of reading such a long work of staying with the same characters over such a long period of time? Really? That's that's your book club question? This, these are questions for the old lady Barnes & Noble book club. Yeah. You know? So a few people, I was just reading some reviews of it. There were a few, like, literary people. Most, pretty much everyone, the critical reviews of this were just like, this is not bad as book. <laughs> but some people hated it, and pretty much the people who hated it all said that it was... Tone deaf dialogue, unyielding plot that goes nowhere, lazy and cliched, and that the little people were not menacing. That last one. Little is people bullshit. are not supposed to be menacing. Those little people were menacing as well, fuck. They, the thing is, on the one hand, they weren't supposed to be directly menacing. Like you they think they're gonna come out but and kill you. But when you read, when you get the actual but, story of Air Chrysalis, of her sitting there with the little people, and they're making the thing, and ho ho, said the keeper of the beat. They just oozed something bad yeah, about to happen. Exactly. It's like, what the hell are they up to? And it's like, everyone was always, always on their guard. Like, you don't want to upset the little people. You know, right? It's like the Eye of Sauron. It's like, okay, is it? can it really do anything directly besides look at you? Not so much. But if it sees you, the Nazgul will come and whatever, I do not right? want his baleful gaze upon me. Right. So, But it's like the little people, it's like you didn't want them to see you. They were up to something no good. They were mysterious. You couldn't reach them. But it felt like they could always reach you, you know? And especially since the way they behaved was so creepy. It's it's like, you know, one of those aliens or horror movies where just there's an alien doing weird stuff. He's not directly attacking or biting or shooting or, you know, whatever. But they're doing weird stuff. What the hell are they up to? Oh my god! Yeah, not not uh, would not want to have some little people hanging out. And it was also menacing because once you know, like the little people like crawl out of someone's body. Anytime like someone was going to sleep, I was like, oh my god, little people are gonna come out. Yeah, I mean they exploded. Stay in, that stay in the room and see the little people come out. Ah. When they exploded that dog. <laughs> yeah, right. That was crazy. Yeah. Anyone who explodes a dog from the inside is menacing. Yeah, I, I was expecting a person to explode after that. I know, right? It never happened. I was worried, though. I was waiting for it. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, is there anything else we can... I mean, we could talk about this for a long time. I could, I, could, I could basically spend about a half hour outlining my whole... Like, all the evidence for the allegory of the relationship between creator and created, but... I think it's self-evident. It's pretty. It's extremely self-evident. It's even one of the stupid questions, which says, in what ways does QT84 question and complicate conventional ideas of authorship? How does it blur the line between fictional reality and ordinary reality? Those two questions are unrelated. <laughs> but the first <laughs> question is conventional ideas of authorship, which is, yeah, that's one of the primary things about them. But the other thing is, you know, a lot of books, you know, great books sort of have a, a main point, you know, like... Uh, Lord of the Flies, main point. Look how people behave when they're left to their own devices, you know, uh, in a society. Animal Farm, right. communism. Right. When you have a book like this, there's actually multiple main points. He's got so many pages to work with and so much going on. You know, there isn't just one main point. It's like, here are all these points coming from the same story. You know, and look how these points tie into each other, sort of, you know, and there is no one simple thing saying the book is saying this. It's like the book is saying all these things and all those things create together, create a mosaic or tapestry that becomes the mm -hmm. message of the book that you can't necessarily say in one sentence. And there are just so many great scenes that just pound those ideas in. Yep. And the scenes themselves are great, almost like though it didn't tie them together well, think about Boondock Saints as a movie. Every individual scene was amazing, mm. but the thread through them was pretty weak. <laughs> this book had scenes like that, but the threads through them were so numerous and so strong. Like, uh, remember when the uh, NHK collector started knocking on all the doors? Oh, when he's not, oh my God. Every <laughs> one of those scenes was great. And when, the one moment when... Uchikawa was there, and the guy knocks on his door. I was like, yes, Uchikawa was going to get a picture of this fucker, and then he didn't. Yep. I was like, no! <laughs> that was that whole sequence with the knocking, the, the dad knocking on the door. I know you're doors, in there. It's like, oh my god. That was 
genius. Everything about this, this book is just great. All right. Uh, if you didn't read it already. <laughs> yeah, if you didn't read it, you should read it, <laughs> even though we just spoiled everything. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna. I should try to get home before I get lightninged and or whatever. All right, so we out. There may or may not be shows next week. There will probably at best be a Monday show, and then I'll be in Sao Paulo, and uh, yeah. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. 